God, we, we desperately need you this morning. Lord, we need your spirit. God, we ask that you would come. Lord, would you speak through me? Uh, would you speak to your people? God, would you convict us of sin? Would you show us um, afresh who you are to see your glory? God, that we wouldn't leave here um, the same that we came, but we would, we would leave here more in love, more in awe of you um, because you're amazing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so like Casey said, we're in this, this season of Advent, and Key's been talking for a few weeks, kind of introed it, and then we talked about Advent hope last week. Um, and we're looking back, like we said, we're looking back to when Jesus came. If Advent is coming, we're looking back to when Jesus came and he broke into history. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. We're looking forward to the fact that we have a great hope that he's coming back again. Like we, we talked about how our hope, our ultimate hope is not in like these bodies. It's, it's not in this world. Our ultimate hope is in a, a, a risen Savior who's coming back again. That's our hope. And so not only looking back and looking forward, but God is working right now. Like God is on the move in this world. And he invites us to be a part of that. He's loving lost people. He's building his church. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about today about like how we're involved in what God is doing even right now. We can appreciate it looking back. We can appreciate it looking forward but he's working now. And we're talking about peace, the peace of Christ. And so I was, I was like, I was getting ready for this message and I was thinking through it, praying through it last week. Um, and I was, I was talking to Casey. I was like, man, you know, it's just kind of, it's like, it's there. I feel like I'm not where I want to be with it. And I'm, I'm working through it, through this message and like talking on the phone to somebody like, how you doing? I'm kind of stressed out like this. I got to preach and I just, I want it to go well. And like, it's weighing on me, and they're like, oh, well, what are you preaching about? Well, I'm preaching about how to experience the peace of Christ, like when things are hard. I'm like, Dang it. Like, there's the sermon. There's the sermon right there. So, like, I, I, need this. I need this as much or more than anybody here. Maybe that's why God has me preaching about it. Um, but it's good stuff. So, so as we talk about peace, you have to understand um, that, like, peace is a theme that runs all throughout God's story. And when we look at Scripture, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. New Testament was written in Greek. But, but the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, like we've said. And that shalom, it means wholeness, like unity. Something being totally complete, like needing nothing. And so if God's story has four chapters, there's creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, we get a, an awesome picture of that shalom peace in creation because God creates everything and it's good. And there, there's perfect peace, kind of in three ways, as I thought about it. There's, there's perfect shalom peace between man and God. Like, there's, there's nothing, like, hindering that relationship between us and God. There's perfect peace between, like, men and, and, and men. Like, there's, there's no conflict among men. And even in creation, the third way, creation itself is at peace. Like, there's no, there's no death. There's no decay. And so we fast forward to chapter 2, and all of that changes. All of that changes because sin enters the world and at the fall, all three of those ways that there was perfect peace are now broken. There's no perfect peace with God because of sin. There's no perfect peace with one another. There's no perfect peace even in creation, in creation itself. Chapter 3, we can talk about at Christmas, like that's when Jesus broke into the world and he begins to bring back that shalom that was lost and the fall and he is the prince of peace. So like it... If, if shalom is lost and broken, then the Prince of Peace, like at, at Christmas, is what we can celebrate, that being brought back together. And finally, like we said, ultimately that restoration. But that's like a, that's like a biblical Christian perspective on peace, right? Shalom. But peace is not something that, you know, only Christians know about. Like the world talks about peace. And I was listening to John Piper this week, and he said, look, the, the world offers peace. And I'm glad that it does. Like it offers good peace, we can experience that from the world because the world offers peace in good circumstances. Like when, when things are good in your life, you can, you can have like a little taste of peace. And that's good. And you can experience peace of mind. We have things like, we, man, we can lock the door at night. We can, we can save some money for retirement. We can go to the hospital if we need to. Like there are ways that we can have peace of mind that, that the world can give us like a little taste of peace. We can experience it like I said, in good circumstances with health and family, job success. 
So, so we get these tastes of peace from the world, but here's the problem. Like, I think because we can taste peace in those ways, in those times, we incorrectly assume that our ultimate peace must come from like more of those little things. It must come from more of those little circumstances of peace. And that's not true. We think that my ticket, like my ticket to have peace and to be happy is to have more money set aside or to have a healthier body or if like the situation in my family was just better, then I would have peace. And so we pursue these little tastes of peace that the world gives us. And as Christians, like we, we might not say, we might not like verbalize that. We might not even, even totally think that like consciously, but I think the way that we live our lives probably says more about what our heart believe than what we would say. Because I think the way that we live our lives is often just in pursuit of more like circumstantial peace. But I, I think there are a lot of people in the world, <laughs> that's a profound statement, right? <laughs> that's crazy, crazy gospel truth for you this morning. There's a lot of people out there, guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs> I think there are a lot of people in the world, continued, that are starving for this shalom peace that we talk about. They're starving for like real inner peace. I know there are because I know some of them. And even in this room, like there's a lot of people in this room. There's a lot of people and that represents like a lot of different sin issues, a lot of different uh, job situations, family struggles. Like there's just a lot of stories. There's a lot of different circumstances in this room. And so if, I, if, we, if we turn this stage into like a, a spectrum of circumstances and over here, like th this stage, this side represents like really good circumstances. If you're at a stage of life where like everything is just going really well, family's good, job's good, like thankful, that's awesome, things are going well, you would stand right here. Come all the way to this side, like if that's the total opposite of that. Oh no. Everything in my life, <laughs> I got nothing else to say. <laughs> everything in my life is terrible. Like my circumstance could not be worse. This is the worst place that I've like ever been in in my life than you would stand here. And if I had everybody in this room come up and stand somewhere on this stage, these are the extremes. Everything's terrible, everything's great. You can stand anywhere you want in the middle. I think that we'd probably take up the whole stage. I think that there are people in this room who would stand all the way over there, and that's great. And there are people who right now are in one of some of the worst spots they've ever been in. And here's the deal. The, the good news for today, the truth for today, is that your peace, like your inner peace, is not dependent on you being in better circumstances. Like, like your inner peace is not you going from here to over there. Because it seems like at Christmas time, no matter where you are on this spectrum, it's just kind of magnified. Like if you're over there and things are going great, then Christmas is amazing and it's time off work, spend time with your family, like you can enjoy, everything's great. But if you're over here, it seems like Christmas time just magnifies that, the fact that you're not over there. And I thought, I thought last year I would be over there by now, or I thought this problem would be done by now. And so we, this just kind of magnified in this season. But your peace is not tied to your circumstance, not Jesus' peace, not shalom peace, because his peace is different. Last weekend, uh, my wife Clara and I got a chance to go on a weekend trip. Our, our friends from college live out in Denver and they just bought a house and they, uh, they wanted us to come out and so I was mad at Florida that it was still hot and it's December and I'm like sweating walking to the car. So I'm like, this is great, we'll go out, we'll see our friends, we'll have a weekend away, we'll get to be where it's cold for a little bit. And so we bought spirit flights. No, don't, don't, no. <laughs> Mistake, don't buy spirit flights. No, it was good, it was perfect for us. If you don't have a lot of money and you wanna just get somewhere uncomfortably, and that was us. We got there, we got there in one piece. It's more like UPS than an airline, but like, <laughs> they got us there. And it's great for me, like with my, my stature, spirit's awesome. Really enjoy that four hour flight. Just a blessing, just a blessing. But, so we get, we go to Denver and we're hanging out, like it's cold, we're loving it, like there's snow, we're like full tourist mode, like 
stop the car, let's take a picture in the snow, it's, and everybody there is like rolling their eyes at us. Um, but here's something I learned is that like, man, hot coffee in the morning when it's cold outside is so much better. It's so much better. If it's, a, if it's 100 degrees outside, hot coffee is good, that's fine. But like when it's 20 degrees and you're like just inside, you got a hot cup of coffee, it's really, really good. And so we wake up Saturday morning um, and my friend's wife comes downstairs and she's like, you know, you guys want coffee? We're like, yeah, I totally want coffee. She's like, well, I have eight different uh, coffee making machines that I can make coffee with. I was like, wow, that's, that's seven more than I know. Like, uh, and so she, she comes and she starts making coffee with like one of these. And I've never seen one of these before, but I learned this is called a siphon coffee pot. And what happens, you, you fill the bottom part of it with coffee, and then as it heats up, is, have you guys know about this? Okay. I'm 25 and I don't know a lot of things, so I didn't know about this. <laughs> and so, like, you, you heat up the water on the bottom, and it, it goes up into the top part where the grounds are, and then it, like, it brews up there, and once it's done, it shoots back down into the bottom, and, and the grounds stay at the top. And so we had, we had this coffee, it was delicious. Um, but here's the deal about this coffee pot, like, Nothing, in that, nothing about that water at the bottom is going to change if it stays, like, down there. Like, you can heat it up, you can stir it, you can blow bubbles into it, you can do whatever you want, but, like, it's going to stay water, if, like, on that horizontal level. But what happens is when, when that water goes vertically, when it interacts with, that, with those coffee grounds, it's transformed into something new vertically. And then when it comes back down, then horizontally, like, it's something completely new. It's something totally new. And so as, as we talk about peace today, like God's peace, shalom peace, here's the deal. Like there is, we're going to talk about peace and community, like horizontal peace. And God calls us to that and he takes it very seriously. But you can't experience horizontal peace, like in the body of Christ, until something has happened in you vertically. Like nothing happens horizontally until you've experienced something vertically in your relationship with your creator. And so we're going to look at um, two different passages. We're kind of going to talk about that vertical piece, the gospel, like that, that first part that is a prerequisite to horizontal piece. And then we're going to look at a passage and, and kind of unpack what that horizontal piece looks like in light of the gospel. And so John uh, 14, 27, this is where we're going to talk about that vertical piece with God. Here's, what, here's what's going on. Jesus is with his disciples Okay? And he is about to be arrested. He's about to go to the cross, and he knows that. And, and that's super significant to what this verse says, because if you think about Jesus' circumstance when he says this, it's not very good. Like, he's about to be arrested and executed. And this is what he says to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he says, look, I'm, I'm giving you my peace. And I'm not giving you the peace the way that the world gives peace. Like those are two different things, like we said. I'm giving you my peace, which clearly goes above his circumstance. And so what we have to understand is that Jesus offers us a different and a better peace than the world offers because it's peace through the gospel. And we can say gospel a lot up here. And gospel is kind of like a church word. And maybe if you've never been in church, you don't really understand when I say gospel. But the gospel is, is the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And it, 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 like, it plays itself out when you understand first who God is, and then you understand who you are and what God says about you. It's amazing. It's amazing. But first, got to know who God is, right? To understand the gospel, we need to know who God is. And there's one word in Scripture that describes God three times in a row. It's the only word that, that Scripture uses three times in a row to describe God. Does anybody, anybody got an idea? Cool. All right. <laughs> the word is holy. God is holy, holy, holy. It's the only word. And the Bible never says that God is love, love, love. It never says that he's awesome, awesome, awesome. It says that he's holy, holy, holy. Holy. And holiness is a concept that we can't completely understand because we're not holy. <laughs> holiness is God's, God's perfection, God's righteousness, like his perfect peace. In himself, like in God's holiness, he is perfectly 
at peace and righteous. And I love in scripture when, when like somebody comes in contact with God's holiness. You get a human person like me and you and God gives them a glimpse of his holiness, of his perfect peace, of like who he is. The response every time is the same. It's the reason why Jesus, a lot of times when he shows himself to somebody, he has to say first, fear not. Because people are afraid and their faces go in the ground because they quickly recognize, oh my gosh, you are so holy. You are so different than me. You are so righteous. And they go, their hands go on the ground. When they get a glimpse of how holy and how different God is and how awesome he is. It happens all over the place. Paul is blinded on the road to Damascus. When, when John is getting a, a vision of heaven, it says he falls to the ground like he was dead. But the good news is we, have a, we serve a God who, who quickly says, fear not. Fear not. So if God is holy, then who am I? Well, I'm not holy and I'm sinful. Because sin is anything that goes against God. And I commit sins constantly, and so do you. There's sin inside of me, there's sin in my heart, and there's sin that I, that I choose. There's actions, sinful actions that I choose. And the Bible says that that sin, it leads to death. Because God is as holy as he is, sinning against him, the punishment is death. And it's three kinds of death. It's, it's physical death, like one day we're all going to die. It's spiritual death, like that shalom in the garden is broken. There's no more connection with God, and it's eternal death. The Bible says that because of our sin, eternally we will be separated from God because he's holy and we are sinful. We don't even understand how holy he is. And that's, pretty, that's bad news. Because there's nothing I can do to like clean up my record. My record's already messed up. If the standard is perfection, even if I was perfect for the rest of my life, doesn't work because I've already been imperfect. The standard is perfection because it's holiness. But at Christmas, we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus broke into the world, right? The fact that this, this massive sin problem that we have is going to be solved by that holy God. See, Jesus broke into the world and he lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live. He never sinned. There's no sin in him. There's no sin on him. And he went to the cross, and he suffered death. But death is, the, death is the penalty for sin, right? And he didn't have sin, so why'd he have to suffer that penalty? Because on the cross, something happens. On the cross, Jesus takes my sin, all of it, all the sin inside of me, all the sin that I've chosen, and he puts it on himself, and he pays for it. Like, the debt is paid, he dies for it, because that's the penalty for it. But the difference is Jesus doesn't stay dead because he's God and three days later he rises again showing that he's even more powerful than sin and death. And so where do we stand? Why would Jesus do that? We're just the sinful, we're just the sinful part of the story. But Jesus, he offers us this trade, this transaction. He says, look, I, I took your sin, the sin that you should have died for and I died for it and because I love you, I'm going to give you my perfection, my holiness, my perfect record, so that now you can be in the presence of a holy God because you're made holy through me. On your own, you're not holy enough to be with God. That sin disqualified you from knowing God, and now you can know him. You can know him right now in this life, and ultimately you can spend forever with him. That's what we mean when we say the gospel. Like, I am a sinner who is saved by grace, through no doing of my own, because there is an awesome Savior. And here's the deal. When, when you understand that that God who is that holy, that people go blind when they see just a, a little bit of his glory, that that's the God who loves you and who cares for you and who like pursues you and who calls you a son, who calls you a daughter, that God the result is peace. <laughs> like the result is peace. Because what, what could be better than that? What situation could, like, could trump that? Nothing. The result of the gospel is peace because the gospel enters into brokenness and it restores shalom. That's what Jesus does. He enters into brokenness to restore shalom. That's God's heart. 
And so when we talk about peace through the gospel, this vertical peace between us and God, when you have peace in your heart, it equals peace in your life. It's not the other way around. See, you, you don't need a better life to have peace. You don't need to move this way on the spectrum to have peace. You need a better peace to have life. You need peace from Jesus to have life, not better circumstances. And so as we, we, we talk about that vertical peace, that's the first part, that's the most important. We're gonna transition and talk about, okay, well, what, is that, what does that look like horizontally among us, among the church? What does that look like? And we're gonna look at Colossians um, chapter three. And, and Paul is writing this, this letter to the church at Colossae. And he didn't, he didn't start this church, but he knows them. And he's writing to like encourage them and instruct them. And, and let's think about Paul's circumstance again for a second. Paul's writing this letter from a prison cell. So like, his circumstance is not great. He's over there. Paul's not having great circumstances, but he's writing and, and preaching the peace of Christ. Because in this church, there were, there were kind of some divisions and they were learning what it meant to be a Christian and, and they, had some, they had some conflict because churches have conflict. Like the Avenue Church is a great church. I'm a really big fan. I like it a lot. But guess what? There's conflict in this church because it's full of sinful people. And I love you and I like you guys, but there is conflict in this church. And so we're, we, can, we can relate to this church at Colossae. And, and Paul is writing to give them a picture of like, what's your part to play in this horizontal piece? Like, how are we at peace in the church? And he starts off by telling them all about Jesus. There's a section called the preeminence of Christ and you need to read it because it's amazing. And so he starts off by saying, Jesus is awesome. And he talks about the gospel like we just did. And now he's gonna get into some instructions. But it's important that he says, hey, these instructions are only instructions because of the gospel. This is not a list of do's and don'ts so that God likes you. This is a list of do's and don'ts because God already loves you. <laughs> so live in this way, because I think it's, it's easy for us to like unpack a list of, that, that says like, don't do this. And we're like, oh, church, like here's a set of rules again. And don't do this, but do this. Now I gotta do this, like slap on the rules. But Paul is, is saying this only after he just describes the gospel, okay? And so here's what he says in Colossians 3. And he's talking to these Christians and he says, like, okay, Christian, person who understands the gospel, put to death, Therefore, what is earthly in you? Put to death. Like, that's, that's a serious statement. And now he goes on this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. Like, be before you understood the gospel, before you had vertical peace, this is what you were like. But now, you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Listen to this. This is like how this piece works out horizontally. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So like I said, we've, we've got to be careful with this because this is, this is like practical advice. Don't do these things. But he prefaces it by saying, don't do these things because of the gospel we just talked about. Don't do these things because of the gospel we just talked about. And that, that phrase, like put, put to death, put to death these sins. I don't know if I put sin to death in my life. Like, that, that's a serious statement. I think sometimes I like my sin, and I can say that it's wrong, and I can push it over there because it's sin, but then sometimes I just, I just like, run back to it. Like, I'm, I'm okay with it sometimes. I kind of, I like, I like to keep it at a distance, but do I put my sin to death because of the gospel? See, I, I, think, I think I'm probably not alone in that, and we can be okay with certain sins in our life, and Paul's saying, put it to death. Because we're all drawn to like a particular sin, 
Like we're, we're all drawn in a certain way. I might not struggle with the same ish, sin issue that you struggle with. And I can sit over here and say like, how can, how can that person struggle with that? Because it's a lot easier to see it's a lot easier to see sin in other people's lives than sometimes it is to see in ours. We, we've got blind spots, but the reality is, like, you're drawn to a particular sin in some way or another because you're still a sinner, and so you've got to figure out what that is. Sometimes that's hard to see on your own, and you need to be in community with other people. And then you just say, man, I, I see this sin in your life. And they're not attacking you, but they're saying, you need to, you need to put that to death because Jesus loves you. So, so, A, do we know the sin that, that our hearts are drawn to? It might not look like somebody else's, but there's something there. And then, B, are you putting that to death? Put it to death. Man, con- confess it. Make a plan. Like, put barriers in your life. Talk to somebody. Get an accountability partner. Like, but be aware of that sin that you're drawn to and put it to death because the gospel is better. And so he goes on in, in Colossians, and, and he kind of makes a transition. That was a lot of, like, put these things to death, and now he's going to say, okay, in, instead of those, put on these. Put on these. So Colossians 12, or 3, 12 through 15, says, put on then, and then look, this is like a little parenthesis again, because this is like the most important thing. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, like just a little reminder of your identity, the work is done. Jesus did the work. That, it's over. You're not doing these things so that God likes you. Just another, like, he prefaces it at the beginning. He puts a little reminder in the middle because it's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. So put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Th- this is that horizontal peace, that horizontal shalom with one another. This is what it should look like. Bearing with one another. And if one of you has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So this is like, this is a picture of that peace, that horizontal peace, a picture of the church that we're bearing with one another. That's not like an easy thing to do, to, to, to like bear with somebody and to, and to walk with somebody closely, forgiving one another, loving one another, forgiving each other when they deserve it and when they don't, and when they ask for it and when they don't. This is what, this is what the peace the shalom peace in the church should look like. And then, man, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. So I think we have to like kind of take an inventory of our hearts and our relationships and say, man, am I, am I experiencing that, that gospel peace in my relationships, in my church, in my family, in my work? Because if, if the gospel go, like pursues brokenness, to bring about shalom, that's what Jesus does, that's what the gospel's about, then that should be true on like a cosmic level, and that should also be true on an individual level in your, in your life. If that's who your God is, then that should be who you are becoming, a person who, who sees brokenness and pursues it to bring about shalom for God's glory. And so that takes a little bit of like, man, like surveying your situation and see where and when you can do that because clearly, clearly there's no direct connection between your circumstances and your peace. Like your shalom peace, your soul peace, being satisfied in your creator because Jesus is preaching peace when he's about to be arrested and killed. Paul is preaching peace when he's sitting in a prison cell. So your circumstances are important, but that's not where your shalom peace from the Father is going to come from. Because if you've been transformed vertically first, then it, it really matters to Jesus, like your relationships horizontally. Because we're the, we're the bride of Christ, right? The church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus loves his bride. Sinful men love their brides. So I got to imagine that a perfect and holy God really, really loves his bride. 
And we're not, we're not called to be at odds with one another. We're not called to be at odds with him, but to have that peace vertically with our Savior and then to, to seek out brokenness and to bring about shalom in community. That's what, he, that's what he calls his church to. And so how do I get shalom? Maybe I've never experienced that. Maybe I've never, like, maybe I've never experienced that vertical peace first. Man, I, I would recommend going to the Prince of Peace to have peace. That seems like a good place to start. Because your peace is not gonna come from sliding up the scale, ultimately, so that you have perfect inner peace in your soul, that that wholeness, that unity, takes place. See, so, so much of the Christian life, like, is just coming to the end of yourself and recognizing that I, I don't have this in me. That I, I need to be transformed that I'm gonna to come to the Prince of Peace with an empty tank and say, Lord, I, I don't have peace. I feel like I'm running on a treadmill after peace. I get a little taste and then I run for another mile. I, I need your peace. God, I'm a sinner and I, and I need you. I, I can't do this anymore. Because as we understand like how we are limited and where our sin is and how finite we are, and then the gospel is applied to that, that's how we grow in Christ. It's not the fact that you become this super Christian over time. You just recognize more and more how sinful you are. And then as that sin is exposed, the gospel is applied. And then that sin is exposed and the gospel is applied. And the good news is when we come to the Prince of Peace with an empty tank, he fills us because he loves us because that's who our holy God who came on a rescue mission for us is. He's holy and he loves his church. And so I just wanna end with two questions. First, have you experienced that vertical peace? Have you experienced the peace of Christ through the gospel? And if you haven't, man, why would you leave here today without experiencing that peace? Because it's awesome. And the second question, is it, if, if yes, and I hope the answer is yes, that you've experienced that peace first, are you, are you experiencing horizontal shalom peace with others as a result of that? Because if you're not, maybe, maybe there's an obstacle, maybe there's like that certain sin that you're drawn to that you've gotta to put to death. Maybe you need to get in community so somebody can tell you about it. But Jesus cares about his bride and he enters brokenness to restore shalom so that we like undeservingly can have this deep, rich gospel peace and live at peace with one another. And lastly, if, if we are the bride of Christ, like, and this is where we can experience that peace and we can see it like individually first in our hearts and then we can see it played out in the church, man, the church should have more peace than any other group of people on the planet. That's what we've been called to because we can hope that there is a future king that's coming back that ultimately is going to perfect all of this. So let's pray. Jesus, God, Prince of Peace, we need you. Lord, I, I ask that, that if there's somebody in this room who hasn't experienced the, your peace, in their soul and they still have a sin problem, God, that they would come to you with an empty tank. Lord, because you fill us. And God, I ask that as your church, we would take seriously living at peace with one another. God, and that we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be so dependent and so stressed out by our circumstances and looking to that to give us peace, but that like Jesus, we can have peace in the midst of even broken circumstances, God, because we're gonna have broken circumstances in a broken world. There's no hope in perfect circumstances, but God, there is hope in a perfect savior. So we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, thank you, Sam. I'm gonna offer our benediction, so if you'll stand, please, I'll ask our prayer partners to come forward.
We're going to keep our, uh, our worship moment relevant here. We'll have some music that's played for a while. And um, if you're one of our prayer partners, you come forward. Um, Sam, Sam gave two invitations. One was the vertical invitation to receive the Prince of Peace through faith and surrender. Uh, we have people down here who would love to walk you through that and help you through what that means and make that a reality today. And we're actually praying that God would, would do that. And so if that's something that you uh, feel God wanting to do, give you this type of shalom peace that you've never really experienced for, it has a name. His name is Jesus. Um, today's your day. So um, come and, and uh, let us pray for you. And he gave a second invitation. There might be some of us who are experiencing some brokenness horizontally, relationships, unforgiveness, bitterness, whatever it might be. I just want to invite you to also be able to either come forward and ask for prayer, for the courage to enter into some of that, or maybe just take a moment with the person who's in this room right now. Just go and take that first step of messiness toward reconciliation. I love, Sam, what, what the Lord had to say through you that Jesus entered into brokenness to bring shalom. You can't actually have shalom without having someone enter into brokenness first. So I'm gonna pray that courage over you guys, that you would receive it from Christ and then give it to one another. I invite you to posture your hands like this because as God's people, we receive a benediction, which is not just a prayer, it's a promise. And here's the promise for God's people. That the God of all peace and wisdom and understanding would not only be with you and for you, but would fill you. And because of what he's worked through the Prince of Peace, that would become contagious to people all around you, both within this church and within our area. May the peace of God and the God of peace be yours both now and forevermore. Amen. Love you guys.